We will now look at our first reinforcement learning algorithm, which is called Q-learning, and which is maybe the most fundamental reinforcement learning algorithm, and maybe the most used reinforcement learning algorithm. We're going to start by having a look at value functions, how to specify and how to evaluate future reward, and by having a look at the Bellman optimality principle, which lead us to the Q learning algorithm. Value functions define the value of a state. In order to learn, in order to learn using reinforcement learning, we have to know how good a state is. And we know how good a state is only through the future rewards that we can expect when starting to act based on that current state that we are in. So how good is a state? The first quantity that we are going to learn is the state value function v. The state value function v superscript pi for the policy, this is a quantity that's defined specifically for a fixed policy pi. So the state value function v pi at state st is the expected cumulative discount reward when following that policy from state st. And that's illustrated here at the bottom. So given a particular policy, let's assume we have trained an agent. This is our policy. The policy tells us which action to take in any state that we could be in. And given the particular starting state st, v pi of st is defined as the expectation over the sequence of future rewards with the discount factor gamma here multiplied to the rewards where the exponent is increased by one with every time step into the future. So we have gamma to the power of zero times rt plus gamma to the power of one times rt plus one plus gamma to the power of two times rt plus 2 and so forth until a fixed time horizon that we consider or in theory we can consider the limit until infinity. But of course in practice we have always to consider a fixed time horizon. Why is there an expectation? The first question. Well the expectation is here because we have to compute a summary over all the stochasticity in the process and that stochasticity could come from the definition of the policy it could be a stochastic policy let me go back here so it could be either deterministic or it could be also a stochastic policy so we have answer, we have stochasticity there and this expo, ex, um, expectation goes over this but also um, the uh, reward distribution and the state transition distribution may be stochastic. So there's also stochasticity in there. And that's all captured by this expectation. Okay, that's why we have this expectation here. And why do we increase this gamma by one with every time step? Well, that's exactly the discount property because we want to not consider a reward that's given to us maybe 1 million time steps into the future as high as a reward that's more close to us, that's nearer, that's maybe just like one minute away. Because we can't effectively search for that long time horizon, so we have to prioritize long -ter uh, shorter term reward. And we do this by specifying the value of gamma, which is a hyperparameter that is between zero and one. Typically, it's very close to one. Um, but the exact specification of value, uh, gamma specifies how far into the future we're looking at when we are seeking to compute the reward. Now this equation can be simplified, of course, into this expression where we have the expectation over all the sum of all k's bigger or equal to zero times gamma to the power of k um, times rtk. Uh, when starting, this is the conditional starting in ST for a fixed policy pi. We're conditioning on the start location and the policy pi. 
Again, this discount factor gamma, which is between zero and one, typically close to one, is the value of the future rewards at the current time. Anyways, immediate reward higher than very far away reward. So for example, if gamma would be 0 0.5, which is a low gamma, but just to illustrate, then we would weigh the, the current reward with a factor of one, but uh, the next time step already just with a factor of one half, and then the next time step with a factor of one quarter and so forth. So we would very quickly decrease the weight that we assign a reward that's provided to us by the environment um, as we go and look into the future. So gamma really determines the agent's far and short -sight sightedness. And it's important that we have this control. For example, we can use this control to avoid infinite returns. Let's assume we have a cyclic Markov process where we can revisit the same state over and over again. So we could obtain infinite reward, but of course our agent can't interact with the environment infinitely. So um, this is uh, also mathematically important to, to have this stopping criterion. Another quantity that we're going to introduce is so-called action value function. The action value function determines how good a state action pair is. It's very similar and related to the state value function. So what's the difference? The action value function Q pi at state st and action at, so it's also conditioned on the action now, is the expected cumulative discounted reward when taking action at in state st and then following the policy pi. This is the same expression that you've seen before, except that we also condition on at now. Right? So we are, we are not um, computing the expectation, we are not averaging over all actions at time step t, but we are assuming we're given a concrete action at that we have taken and we want to know the value given the policy and the state st and the action at. There's this additional conditioning. And of course, the discount factor plays the same role here. It is the value of the future rewards, given that we consider this rollout, this um, rollout of the actions in that environment, starting from time step t. Now, the optimal state value function v star, we often use this star to indicate that something is optimal, so we're going to use it here as well. The optimal state value function v star of st is the best v pi, the best state value function v pi over all policies pi. v pi is what we had defined before, and v star is simply the maximum of v pi over all possible policies. That's of course a very huge space that we're looking at here, but mathematically it's easy to define. So this is the optimal state value function and intuitively it tells us the, the maximal um, value that we can obtain, the maximal cumulative uh, discounted future reward that we can obtain if we would have by a miracle, by an oracle, the optimal policy. And the optimal action value function Q star of ST80 similarly is the best Q pi of ST80 over all policies pi. So similarly as before we have Q pi, which we had defined on the slide before, and now Q star is the maximum of all the policies of Q pi. So it's the best policy that we can achieve and it gives us the maximal value that, can, that we can achieve if we start at state st and we have already conducted action at. In other words, the optimal value functions specify the best possible performance in the Markov decision process. However, unfortunately searching of all possible policies pi is in most cases computationally intractable, except for very simple cases and we're going to look at an illustration, a very simple case in a few slides where we can actually see the optimal policy, but in most cases is impossible. 
so it's a theoretical concept it's what we'd like to achieve however let's assume for a second that q star would be known let's assume q star would be known in that case what would be the optimal policy what would be the optimal policy pi can you imagine that there's a very interlinked relationship between um, the optimal action value function and the optimal policy. Do you see that? It's this. If we know the optimal action value function Q star, then we have already the optimal policy because we just need to find the maximizer of that action value function with respect to all possible actions. The action is an input, it's an argument to this function. And if we search over all the possible arguments and find that action that maximizes Q star, we have the optimal action that we should take in state ST. So if we would know Q star, we would have access to the optimal policy already. Unfortunately, we don't. <laughs> Searching over all possible policies is intractable in most cases and therefore determining Q star in the first place is hard in general, at least for most interesting problems. But to get a better understanding, let's have a look at a very simple example now where the optimal policy is easy to compute or even to see by just looking at the problem with the naked eye. And this is the problem that we're considering. It's a simple grid world where we have this grid here and our agent can be in any of these locations, of these discrete locations. And the goal is to reach one of these terminal states indicated with a star in the least number of possible moves. And the possible moves are going left, going right, going up or going down. And a penalty a negative reward is given for every transition we make. So we want to be as quick as possible going to the terminal states indicated by the star. A random policy in this case would give a random probability to each of the four possible actions when being located in each of these grid cells. That would be just a random choice. But how would the optimal policy look like? I give you five seconds to think about it. It's not very hard here because we, in our brains, we have a very good spatial planner. We know how to get from A to B efficiently. So how does the optimal policy look like? It looks like this. If we would be located here, then the only reasonable thing to do is to go up because this is the only action we should take. It's the only action where with one single move we can get to terminal state. And so that's the optimal action. On the other hand, if we would be located here, then there's two possible actions that are optimal. We can either go up and then right, or we can go right and then up. Because both of these take us to a terminal state in two moves. But we can't go left because we'd need more moves to go to any of these two terminal states and so forth. So this is the optimal, in this case, discrete policy for this particular MDP. Now, this was a simple example, but in general, it's not so easy. As mentioned, we can't just search over all possible policies or even just look at the map and use our very good path planner inside our brains. So how can we solve for the optimal policy in practice? And this is where the Bellman optimality equation comes into the game. The Bellman optimality equation is named after Richard Ernest Bellman, who introduced dynamic programming in 1953. This is Mr. Bellman here on the right. And almost any problem which can be solved using optimal control theory can be solved via the appropriate Bellman equation. So the Bellman equation, and in particular the Bellman optimality equation is really important. And also optimal control theory is kind of a field that uh, came earlier than, than the hype and reinforcement learning. And many of the 
terms that we know in reinforcement learning have an analogy in optimal control theory. So they are very interlinked, these two. Um, and so, well, in 1950, it was all called control theory. But let's, let's go back now. Let's see what the Bellman optimality equation says. The Bellman optimality equation, well, there exists one for the Q function and one for the V function, but we are going to consider the action value function Q because as we've seen, this is a very useful function to, a very useful quantity to have because if we have it, then we already have the optimal policy. So we are going to look at Q, Q star. So the Bellman optimality equation, or short BOE, decomposes Q star as follows. Q star is uh, defined as the expectation of the, over the future cumulative rewards. This is the equation. The first row is the equation that we've seen already. And what the Bellman optimality equation now does it is it translates this expression here, which go, which looks into all future time steps into a recursive formulation that only looks in one time step into the future. As you can see here, we don't have t plus 2, t plus 3, and so on, so forth in that equation, but we just have rt and st plus 1. So we have a, a recursive formalism because we have q star of st a t equals something, an expectation, um, where inside that expectation we have q star of st plus 1. That's is where, that is where the, the recursive formulation lies. So the recursive formulation of this um, Q function, the Bellman optimality equation, comprises two parts. The first part is the current reward. This is the same as we had here on the top. And the second is the discounted optimal action value of the uh, successor. And this is gamma max Q star with respect to all possible actions. So we're maximizing over all possible actions. We are trying to find the optimal um, value into the future, right? We're querying the same function into the future. So we don't have to write down the indices into the future. We don't have to compute that reward because that reward, that discounted reward is already inside the optimal Q function if we only had already the optimal Q function. It's specified for the optimal Q function, so we can just use it and reformulate it recursively. So this is just a summary of this. And because we have already assumed here that we know Q star, we don't need to compute this into the future. So we can define it recursively, right? So this is this, and this becomes this. Now, the problem is, of course, we don't have Q star still. <laughs> so what can we do? We want to determine Q star. How can we solve the Bellman optimality equation? Unfortunately, the BOE is nonlinear because of this max operator. So there is no closed form solution. But luckily, several iterative methods have been proposed, most prominently Q learning. And that's what we're going to have a look at after we finish uh, quickly looking at the Bellman optimality equation and proving why it's actually true. So here we went very quickly from here to here, but why is this equality actually correct? Let's look at this in a little bit more detail. Why can we transform this expression here that looks into all future time steps through, why can we express this as this recursive formulation? So here is the definition of the Q star function, the optimal action value function again, which is just the expectation of the future cumulative rewards given that we are at state S and we have taken action A. Now what we can do is we can write this, as we've already seen, in this more compact form. The sum over all K bigger or equal to zero of gamma to the power of k times r t k and conditioned on the state action. Now what we can do is we can pull the first element here outside. The first element 
where k equals zero, we have gamma to the power of zero, which is one. So this goes away. And we have rt. So we can just pull this out. So we have rt plus something. And what we've also done is for this plus something, we have pulled out gamma such that now this sum here, the index still starts from zero, but now here we have added a plus one so that uh, the sum starts one element later and the gamma is still to the power of k, which is effectively one less now, right? Um, um, because we have pulled that, that gamma out here. Now, if we inspect this closely, what we can see is that this expression here is exactly the optimal state value function v star of st plus one. We haven't specified the action. We haven't conditioned on the action at plus one. We have only conditioned on the action at. That's why it's not the optimal action value function. It's the optimal state value function. This is the expected, uh, this is the future uh, cumulative reward um, in uh, for the uh, optimal policy, right? Um, because we are, optim uh, we, are, we are considering here the optimal action value function. So we can, we can simply replace this. And now, of course, um, the optimal action value function is simply the optimal, sorry, the optimal state value function is simply the optimal action value function if maximized over the action space A, right? Um, because we have assumed here that this is optimal, we, the action that we take must be the optimal action. So it must be the one that maximizes Q star. And now we see this recursive formulation that comes out of this proof. This is exactly the BOE that we have introduced before on this slide here. Okay, good. Now, <clears throat> why is it useful to solve the BOE? A greedy policy which chooses the action that maximizes the optimal action value function Q star or the optimal state value function V star takes into account the reward consequences of all possible future behavior. That's what we know now, right? So why are Q star and V star the optimal expected long-term re return or reward is turned into a quantity that's locally and immediately available for each state or state action pair. That's why it's so useful. Locally now we can determine the po best possible action. We have seen this before. If we know Q star, we know the op optimal action to take. The policy is implicit in Q star. And we know this now, we don't have to do this rollouts anymore, but we have learned how to do the optimal action without having to look into the future because it's encoded in Q star. So for V star, we still need a one step ahead search in order to yield the optimal action, but Q star effectively caches the results of all one step ahead searches. And that's why we look into Q star here because it's more immediately related to the optimal policy as shown on a few slides before. Now, how do we get Q star? Still, uh, we haven't answered that question. And this is where Q learning comes into play. And it's a very simple algorithm. Q learning basically iteratively solves for Q star. This is the equation from before. This is the Bellman optimality equation for the optimal action value function Q star. You can see the recursive uh, way this is formulated here. And so Q learning iteratively solves for Q star. Q star is a function of ST and AT. So we want to, if this is ST and AT, if these are discrete state and action uh, spaces, then this is just a table, for example, right? So we want to solve for that table the elements of that table. And we do that by constructing an update sequence, Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4, and so forth, using learning rate alpha. And we do it like this. QI plus one 
is set to one minus alpha qi, the previous q function at st80, plus alpha times um, what's inside here, times rt, the, the current reward, plus gamma maximum overall actions qi st plus one, the expected future reward given the current state of the current estimate of the q function and the current state and action we are in. So in other words, we're having an, you can think of this as having an agent running around in an environment and doing updates to this big table iteratively for a very long time until we have found the optimal table Q star. And this is the update rule that we are going to use. It can be rewritten in the following form. If we um, pull QI out and then uh, we, we have QI, the old value here on the left, plus alpha, this is the learning rate, times um, the uh, target value, RT plus the expected future reward, given the current state, the current estimate of QI, minus the current prediction, QI of ST80, given the current estimate of QI. And this is called the temporal difference error because what we're doing here effectively is we're updating Q by going a little bit closer to the target by using, by exploiting the reward at the current time and what we expect about the future rewards and moving a little bit away from QI into the direction of this target. So we're doing a temporal difference error. Temporal here refers to the iteration time steps. And the interesting thing about this is, and we're not going to show it here in this lecture, but there is proofs that demonstrate that under certain conditions, QI will converge to Q star if we just iterate long enough. So it's a really useful algorithm because we can actually, if we anneal the learning rate in the right way, we can uh, figure out Q star. We can get this final table Q star that we're interested in that gives us the optimal policy that we are interested in. The policy, however, pi is only learned implicitly via this Q table. So we still have to extract the optimal policy then afterwards from the Q star table. The implementation is very simple because this equation is so simple. We initialize the Q table and the initial state as zero randomly and then repeat. Observing a state ST, we choose an action AT according to the epsilon greedy strategy, which we have introduced in the previous unit. Note that Q learning is an off policy algorithm. It's called off policy as the updated policy, the policy that we're updating, this QIs, is different from the behavior policy because we're using the epsilon greedy algorithm. We want to also exploit, not just explore because we're learning it. And that's why it's called an off policy learning algorithm. Then we observe the reward RT and the next state as T plus one, and we compute the TD error as uh, per the equations on the previous slide. And then we simply update the Q table and we repeat and repeat and repeat again. Now this is very nice. It's a very simple algorithm, but what's the problem of using these Q tables? Well, the problem is simply that not all problems that we might be interested in fit into this paradigm. Not all problems might have discrete state action spaces. So the problem is really about scalability. Tables don't scale to high dimensional state action spaces. Think for example of Go, where we ha have this like extremely large action space with more uh, state space with more than like um, more states than atoms in the universe as mentioned in the video before. So we can't uh, create a table that has more rows than the atoms in the universe, even for the seemingly simple environment of Go. And of course, this is also true for self-driving where we have an image with many pixels, uh, which can take many different values. So the possible observation space is really huge. The solution here is to use a function approximator, for example, neural network instead to represent Q of SA, to not represent it through a table, 
but through a function approximator like a neural network that takes as input the state and the action. Think for example about a convolutional neural network that takes as input the image that the self-driving car observes and uh, the action and uh, we can then maximize, we can try to optimize for that action at test time. And that's what we're going to look at in the next unit.